Good morning, good afternoon. This is Richard Eidlin, the National Policy Director for Business for America, and we're really happy to have you participate in our webinar today on America's Civic Education Gap, what the business community can do to further civics education across the country. And for those of you not familiar with Business for America, I'll just mention that we are a national nonpartisan not-for-profit that is focused on engaging and then mobilizing businesses to help support a healthy democracy. And part of a healthy democracy, we believe strongly, is an educated public. And we have been working on this issue of civic education uh, for about a year and a half now. And just quickly, that evolved out of work we did in 2020 and 2021 following the election and our focus on voting rights. And we worked with hundreds of companies across the country on voting rights, the John Lewis uh, Advancement Act. And what we learned from those companies was they were very concerned about polarization, misinformation, and a, a sense that within, even within their workforces and their communities, that many people were not really familiar with how government works, that we have three branches of government, that there is a Bill of Rights, that the, what the Constitution says. And so as we began to talk with more and more companies, we recognize that just as we've invested in STEM education over the past several decades, we needed to invest in civic education so that people, again, in communities and schools and the workplace we're better informed about uh, how, how politics works, how elections are conducted, how government works. And so we partnered with uh, iCivics, and we'll talk about that in a moment, um, in supporting a federal piece of legislation called the Civic Secures Democracy Act. This was a piece of legislation that Senator John Cornyn from Texas and his colleague Chris Coons from Delaware in the Senate co-sponsored along with uh, two members in the house that called for a billion dollar investment in civics education that money would have been allocated to states who then gave would give it to localities to support uh, state-based civic education curriculum and um, as we'll learn uh, there was partial success in that effort but um, we're still we're still pushing that forward, and there's more work to be done. But essentially, um, the case to be made for business investment in civics education, as we'll hear from Chris Connor in particular from Allstate, is a more educated workforce, a workforce that has good collaboration skills, and a school age population that again becomes better acquainted with how government works, how the political system and the economic system within which those kids uh, live, how that works. So you can see here just quickly a list of some of the companies that participated in our Civic Secures Democracy Act campaign last year. So going forward, we have organized this webinar really as a continuation of the past year's work and in an effort to make sure more businesses understand the importance of civic education, not only nationally sort of as a broad objective, but even maybe more particularly what's happening in your community, in your state, and maybe in the school that your kids go to. And I'm sure you all have been reading and hearing about some of the controversy about civics education and what's being taught and um, the debate as to how to explain to young people in particular the history of the United States. So again, Business for America and our colleagues on this call feel it's very important that students have uh, a broad understanding of the history of the United States and uh, that they become informed citizens. So in an effort to do that, this panel includes three really outstanding leaders and thinkers who've been working on 
the issue of civic engagement and civic education. And that includes Louise Dubay, the executive director of iCivics, which is a national uh, education curriculum development company. And Louise has been doing that work uh, for many years, but started as the ED with iCivics in July of 2014. Um, we also have with us uh, Chris Connor, who's with Allstate Insurance. And Allstate is a very large national company you all probably are familiar with. And Chris has been in that role with Allstate for about 14 years and tracks a whole range of policy issues in his role as the director of political advocacy. And also Kristen Campbell is the CEO of an organization called Philanthropy for Active Civic Engagement. And uh, PACE is a consortium of philanthropic institutions that also see the value in investing in civic education across the country. So welcome everyone. And um, we will begin with uh, Kristen giving us a sense of sort of the nature of civic engagement and how the public perceives civic engagement, civic education, and this broader issue of a healthy democracy. So Kristen, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. I'm very happy to be here. So as Richard mentioned, my name is Kristen Campbell. I lead PACE, Philanthropy for Active Civic Engagement. We, like BFA, are a nonpartisan membership-based organization, and our members are philanthropic institutions. We bring our members together to find ways to collaborate and experiment with each other and to hopefully do all of that in a way that models what what vibrant civic space can look like. We believe that we can only achieve our vision if Americans are both informed and engaged in democracy, and that is what drives our interest in civic education and our belief that it is one of the highest impact ways to achieve our vision. So, I know you all have been working on this work for a while, so I won't spend too much time here, but I think it's important to acknowledge that there are several different definitions of what civic education is and what constitutes a civic education experience. But something that we see as a witty, pretty widespread agreement um, across those definitions is that it's about building the knowledge, skills, and dispositions for people to participate in the American form of democracy, both American government and our systems of self-governance. We know that there are gaps in access of who gets these civic education experiences, and those gaps often occur along the lines of race and class. Young people from lower income families in both urban and rural areas in particular have fewer civic learning opportunities, and as a result, um, they have diminished levels of civic engagement and participation. And so we really then believe that these disparities in educational access contribute to disparities in access to participation, and that then self-perpetuates um, existing societal divisions and inequities across our nation. So we believe that civic education done right can help um, break many cyclical problems. So today we're focusing primarily on K-12 and, and particularly on opportunities for K-12 policy, but I just wanted to note that there are many ways that people experience and engage in civic education in many different contexts. So why does civic education matter? I probably don't have to tell many of you since you signed up for this call, but in short, um, it matters to the functioning and success of small L liberal democracies. Democratic societies are a better places to live. There are better places to do business. And the key to, in our view, the key to keeping democracy is ensuring that society is self-governing. Um, and the key to that is ensuring that people have the civic knowledge, skills, and dispositions to participate. 
So PACE conducts a couple of different types of research. And one of our projects shows us that one of the biggest differences or predictors of how people feel about democracy and some of the core values and tenants within it is whether or not they had a civic education. So on democracy in particular, people who have had a civic education experience are 12.7% more positive about democracy than those that did not have a civic education experience. Other concepts commonly associated with democracy where people with civic education view it more favorably and more positively than those without include concepts and ideas like civility, which has a 26.4% um, positive differential. That's the biggest that we see. Bridge builder, 14.4%, and liberty at 13.3%. And I in my opinion, um, I think that this is interesting because some of these ideas and ideals are ones that are being critiqued a lot lately in our public discourse. And in some cases, the very legitimacy of them as ideas and values is in question. And so I show you this data to say that um, our data suggests that, um, that there's a high relationship between civic education and the positivity of democratic values and those therefore those who have had a civic education experience may be more likely to embrace and advocate for these principles. Our research also shows that people who have had civic education are more likely to think that participating, being active participants in democracy matters in order to ensure that democracy works. In fact, they are more likely than those without civic education to see the value in every single one of the civic engagement activities that we polled. Some of the most significant differences that we saw are voting. There was an 18% positivity differential. Serving on a jury, 17% differential. People with civic education being 17% more likely to believe that serving on a jury matters to ensure that democracy works. Attending public meetings is 16%. Volunteering is 14%. And serving in the military or doing a year of civilian service is 12% different. So at PACE, we believe that the office of citizen, people embracing the office of citizen as the highest office in all the land, um, is critical in order to ensure that democracy works. And these activities are what we believe constitute, part of what we believe constitutes um, the office of citizen and ensuring that self-governance is possible. So in my view, these data speak to the long-term impact of civic education in determining whether people will participate actively as an adult in our society. So personally, I find some of those gaps particularly concerning, but not actually the most alarming thing that I see on in these data. What I think is the most alarming distinction between whether people had civic education or not is that people who did not have civic education, 20% of them do not believe that there's anything that they can do, anything that they can do to ensure that democracy works. There are no actions, activities, or behaviors that they can participate in that would influence democracy. 20%, that's 5% for people who did have civic education. And so I would say that that is not great for democracy and our data suggests that um, civic education is important to ensuring a sense of agency and efficacy. Finally, and, and uh, Richard started to talk about this already, um, recent narratives and headlines would have us believe that civic education is deeply polarized and that there is not agreement that it should be taught at all much less how it should be taught. 
Many of those narratives would have us believe that the public thinks that civic education is a Trojan horse for CRT. Um, but recent polling from a number of groups, not just one, but a number of groups, um, points to data that demonstrate that citizens that are parents and not parents, voters uh, in both parties and across income levels um, do want civic education taught. Not only that, they want it taught more, they want it to be a higher emphasis in the curriculum and they want more public funding to support it. Further data, suggest that the, the history wars, as we might call these um, debates about history and civics education, um, that the history wars are largely being fought between imagined enemies. While there are meaningful differences and disagreements and differences of opinion about how and what should be taught in schools, data suggests to us that these differences are not as extreme as many narratives would have us believe. Um, more in common is the group that did this research and they call this the perception gap. We all are predisposed to believe that people who are different than us, that their beliefs are um, more extreme and farther away from ours than they actually are. So with that, um, I will stop. I'm looking forward to engaging in the conversation with you all today and exploring ways that philanthropy and business can support civic education more meaningfully for more people. Great, Kristen, thank you. That was very informative. We're gonna dig into some of the details you mentioned there, but I just wanted to point out, you know, one statistic that I've seen suggests that, you know, young people, um, are, there's an increasing number of young people open to alternative forms of governance and more supportive of authoritarian uh, means, which you know certainly relates to your point of people being ill-informed, misinformed, or uninformed, and um, uh, you know that that is problematic. So that is a role that we think that businesses can help to play uh, by educating their workforce. Mm -hmm. And we'll get back to that. Um, Louise, let me turn to you here now. And, you know, the focus of iCivics has been particularly working with educational institutions and educators across the country, uh, particularly at the state level. But I know you've done some work also uh, federally pushing the Civic Secures Democracy Act. So um, we look forward to hearing your assessment of some of the opportunities at the state level and a little bit of history, if you would, on the Civic Secures Democracy Act. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to BFA for inviting me and for their partnership in, in uh, making civic education a priority for our nation, which is really critical. And thank you for Kristen, to Kristen for such a wonderful landscape uh, about the civic education field, but also uh, making the case that it has an impact, right? So civic education is directly beneficial and it's directly beneficial to uh, businesses in particular because their businesses are so involved in their communities and it is important to them, I think, uh, to have a well-functioning society uh, that solves its problem. So let me just start by saying that I, I am the executive director of iCivics um, and we are the brainchild of Sandra Day O'Connor who stepped down from the Supreme Court and thought there was nothing more important than to prepare and engage young people because otherwise we would not have a functioning democracy. She had been a state legislator and she knew what it takes to solve problems together uh, through compromise, through skills, through evidence and so on and so forth. And we need young people to care uh, and to think that there are solutions. I think Kristen's absolutely right. If people think they have no means, what are they gonna do? They need to have those means and to be prepared to do it equitably. So we have, uh, provide free uh, civic education at scale. About 9 million students use our materials every year. We work uh, across all political views in every state in our nation and territory. Uh, more than half high school and middle school students use our materials. So it is possible to do this in a nonpartisan way. Uh, so I'm here basically to uh, reflect what needs to be done. So we're moving from the landscape to what can we do? 
Um, and I will paint the picture of where we are now. It's not particularly great. Um, we are not doing uh, enough to train our students. Uh, we spend $50 per year per student on STEM education and five cents on civic. And, and this is just one, and this is federally, only one statistics. And it's not about comparing or saying STEM is a fantastic investment. It's kept our nation at the leading edge of technology. And we have to also recognize that for us to be a leader, leading world power, which is what we are, we also need a functioning system of democracy. And that is why this investment is necessary. Only seven states require standalone middle school courses. Only nine states require a full year of civic education in high school. And I can tell you in addition to that, that we know there is less civic education at the elementary level than there was 20 years ago. So this discipline has been disinvested for decades. And the reality is, as Kristen pointed out, that most parents, most uh, uh, voters, uh, the general public believe that civic education is a solution and we're seeing tremendous momentum to get it back. Uh, and what we need to do that is an investment by adults in K-12 civic education, among many other civic education. So what uh, civic, iCivics did uh, to address that situation is to form the Civics Now Coalition, of which the uh, Business for America is a member. And we've seen the growth uh, tremendous, which reflects this momentum for this discipline. Uh, we started with 48 members in 2018, and now we have 270 members across the political and as Richard described, uh, we are supporting in particular uh, the Civic Secures Democracy Act because we believe that this nation needs an investment commensurate with the problem. Our democracy is under tremendous threat and we need the resources to fight back and to say our system of government can work and we need to put muscle behind it. And uh, we are incredibly thankful uh, to Senator Cornyn, uh, Senator Coons, um, Representative DeLauro, and Representative Todd Cole uh, as the lead co-sponsors of this legislation. Uh, grateful for their leadership on this and many, many others. Uh, we were, while we were not successful at passing the act uh, this past session, uh, we were successful at getting a significant increase in funding for history and civics education from 7.75 million to $23 million, and we're really grateful um, to our leaders in Congress uh, to have done that. Uh, well, as Richard said, most of the funding uh, from the Civic Secures Democracy Act would go directly to states. They know best how to invest the funds uh, for their communities and what works in their communities, where you live in a federalist system, which we all believe in, and that is the best investment. Now, we are also working on state policies. There's much that can be done at the state level. Our goal is to have at least 10 states where the vast majority of students graduate civic ready by 2026. That's achievable. We have seen an enormous increase in the number of state legislation filed over the last four years from roughly 20 of 80 bills to over 250 this year, we, we anticipate. All of the legislation that we support and advocate for is bipartisan. And we think we have significant opportunities in the states that are in green here. So Alaska, Montana, Minnesota, Michigan, Missouri, New York, Maryland, so on and so forth. And I, I will note that many of these bills support informational literacy goals. And I think this is an area where the business community um, should also be engaged, which is that the detection of mis and disinformation is a skill that is relevant to our democracy today. You cannot have a history of civic education program without being able to tell what's true from what's not true. So um, at this point, we're working with 40 state coalitions 
we provide them with support, engagement, funding, and so on and so forth, so that they can be effective at passing, as I said again, bipartisan and proactive civic legislation. We welcome the support of the business community in doing that, partly because of this interest that the community has in ensuring that our communities work to solve common problems. That is what our system of governance is meant to do, meant to have prepare us with the knowledge, the skills, and the disposition to solve important problems that affect everyone. And the business community has that as a goal shared along with all of us. So I'll stop there. Great. Louise, thank you so much for that information. That's really helpful. And let me just note that Business for America is working in a number of states quite actively now, including Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Indiana. And in Indiana, as an example, we're working with an existing coalition, but that uh, hadn't necessarily brought the business community in as actively as they might. So such companies as Cummins and Salesforce are now part of a fledgling business cohort that's going to make the business and economic case for why civics education is so important, you know, really reflecting everything that Louise uh, and Kristen have already said. So we're doing the same thing in Pennsylvania, look to do similar work in Ohio and several other states. So those of you who are located in a particular state have a headquarters or significant employee presence, you know, we'd really welcome partnering with you in one or more states, because it, it certainly makes a difference. And I also just wanted to highlight one thing that Louise pointed out, but really wanted to amplify it, that the Civic Secures Democracy Act um, did not call for a federal mandate. There was no claim that there would be a one-size-fits-all approach. That is a contention that was uh, critics of the legislation made but there's absolutely no merit to that. Um, and instead, as Louise said, decisions about what gets taught is based on state standards and local school districts. Um, Louise, there is a question here, and maybe Kristen, you also want to answer it before we go on to Chris. And um, the question is from Dave Wenzel. And Dave says, you know, interesting information on public support for civics education and the perception gap. Are there any case studies of initiatives to expand civics education that received a significant pushback due to the perception gap? And then how was it maybe navigated successfully to deliver the curriculum um, that turned people around where they recognized that um, you know, there wasn't a political agenda here? Um, so Kristen, do you have an example or Louise, an example you, we could highlight here for a moment? I think Louise is, is closer yeah. to the right. work in many states, so I'll let her weigh in on this. I'm not going to speak about a particular state, but what the um, participant has highlighted is absolutely happened, right? So I think there are forces that are uh, want to divide, um, and what we need is leadership from all uh, colors and all partisans who are patriots and who understand how to uh, shape legislation so that it can uh, attract um, it, uh, Americans of all stripes. So that has happened. And despite the fact that there, were, um, there was a lot of pushback against a number of uh, legislative uh, pushes for um, more proactive civic education, uh, we were able to get these success. And the way that we do that um, is to ensure that uh, leaders stand up, uh, leaders like Senator Cornyn, uh, leaders like uh, Tom Cole, who say, but you know what? I got civic education. I got a good civic education. This is a patriotic thing to do. This is about our country. Uh, and it's not about any particular political agenda. It is about teaching students the knowledge, skills, and disposition. So. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not, um, there were different ways to do it politically uh, in uh, different places, but it's really important for leaders to stand up and say, right. uh, no, this is about our country. Right. Thank you, Louise. 
Um, and also just a, another quick question here from, um, from Alan La Police. I may be mispronouncing the last name, sorry if I am. But um, Alan is asking essentially, what can the business community do to respond to these trends and this attack, uh, you know, on democracy? And you know, I'll just opine for a moment and mention that Business for America's singular mission really is to educate and then engage businesses in defense of a healthy democracy that increases political stability, that reduces polarization. And what Alan also points out is that the critique about civics education or wokeism by companies or woke educational policies, you know, really touches on a whole range of issues now, including, as he points out, environmental, social, and governance um, policies that many companies, particularly publicly traded companies, hold dear. So I would suggest to to Alan, and then I'm going to turn to Chris because you know Chris, with a large national company, has some perspectives on this. I think the answer here is that business leaders, as Louise noted, really have an important role to play in both legitimizing the idea that civic education is valuable to our national security to our economic success, to reducing hyperpartisanship, and that um, elected officials um, listen to the business community um, because you know, generally business is seen as a nonpartisan player in society and has credibility in many communities. So, um, so we can talk more about that, but let me, now turn it to Chris Connor from Allstate. And Chris, um, you know, I know that Allstate CEO Tom Wilson is a real proponent of civics education and has encouraged the company and its employees to invest in civic education for its own for the workforce uh, within Allstate. And you have a presence, I believe, in every state in the country with you know thousands of agents. But the company has also supported some particular, um, you know, community-based initiatives. So, tell us a little bit about why civic education is so important for Allstate as a as a large business, if you would. Certainly, Richard, and uh, thanks so much for for hosting us again. Uh, we were part of the first webinar last year, so uh, we're happy to uh, return to the fold. I think I want to start with a, a verbatim quote from uh, from Tom Wilson that encapsulates the, the philosophy here. Um, so he said, whatever the reasons, the slow retreat from civics education certainly has led to an embarrassing lack of knowledge about American institutions and processes. Civic engagement is the air that keeps democracy alive. We all need a refresher course on civics from children in school through leaders of business and government. I just think that's a particularly eloquent and salient way of, of expressing you know Tom's philosophy, and also how we, um, you know, trickle that down through the uh, through the organization. Um, you know, speaking to the piece about some of those efforts um, externally, we're really proud, um, and this is really for you, Louise. Um, we're really proud that uh, Illinois is one of the states where civics education is required for high school graduation, uh, and that came as a result of a public-private push. Uh, to get that uh, legislation through the uh, through the Illinois legislature, but what it also required, in addition to that, uh, you know, that business leader support in the, uh, you know, in the Illinois business community, was it within all state an active grassroots push from our people that um, required us just to educate them on why this was important and why they should take action via our uh, our grassroots network. And that's that's probably a good uh, opportunity to seg into uh, what I'd like to to share with our audience. So if you'll permit me a moment, I um, I will do that. So um, what you're looking at here is the Advocate for Good uh, hub, which is uh, our intranet based advocacy hub for our employees and agents. Um, you can see here that uh, there are a number of civic engagement actions that you can take as a, uh, as a visitor to the site. You can see that uh, you can take action when we have active grassroots uh, calls to action. Um, you can share a story about how you participate in the process. 
um, you can complete an advocacy interview. So if you know policymakers or have um, you know, an interest in, in certain uh, you know, advocacy tactics, whether it's uh, you know, being an in-person um, you know, visitor to Congress or uh, state houses to advocate on behalf of all state, we can identify this. Um, at the very bottom, you can also see uh, what engagement looked like uh, for us last year. So yes, I do take part in uh, the, the advocacy actions that my shop runs. Uh, so when you see zero and zero, that is not an accurate reflection. I did take part last year, but uh, we did keep up just to uh, you know, spur people to action what we did last year, which is what you see on the left bottom. Um, but finally, and where I really wanna delve into um, how we have changed our view on civic engagement is get out the vote. So historically, we just did get out the vote when you might expect. Elections coming up, we wanted to live into our, our history of, of civic engagement and education. Uh, so we would launch campaigns, say like 2018, 2020, and then they would just go away. What we have done now is this is permanently part of the Advocate for Good site because um, you know, what we realized during uh, 2020 especially is there was a real thirst um, to really understand like Civics 101, how to participate in the process. I'm a, uh, I'm a Philadelphia transplant living in the Chicagoland area, resident of Illinois. So what you're looking at is with our single sign-on technology, um, my constituent profile, voter resources, um, early voting information, um, if I remember the military, um, what I should what I should do, um, and this is all information that is nonpartisan. It's available elsewhere, but speaking to um, you know some of what uh, my co-panelists said, people at times are really confused about you know are these resources real? Are they really nonpartisan? Am I am I in a no spin zone? Um, so we provide that resource, and you know taking it one step further. There are, um, you know, available to you at any time, a full list of the candidates who are up for re-election, but also just the, um, just the people who represent you in your area. For many folks, this is the first time, and this is this is true. Um, people have anecdotally told us, "Oh, this is the first time I now know who represents me um, at the state level," because you know that level of granularity is not one that a lot of people, um, either they don't make the distinction between those folks and Congress, or um, they just never, uh, you know, they just never really closely examine um, who's representing them, which is an important, it was super important part of the, uh, the civics education process um, as like continuing education. Um, and then the next level down is, um, if you click into any of those candidates, this is Mary Beth Can Canty, who uh, actually lives in my neighborhood here in uh, Arlington Heights, Illinois, uh, Chicago suburb, you get a direct pull um, from their candidate or, uh, you know, or, um, you know, active legislator websites. And you can even go deeper and do their full profiles, their, uh, you know, uh, the committees that they sit on, um, you know, key issues. So really, uh, the big idea is um, we want to provide our workforce with a, with a resource that allows them to be good um, civil civic actors in their in their communities. Great. Good. Thank you, Chris. L let me let me dig into that a little bit more with a question about the competencies that employees develop from going through some civic education program. And that would also, I think, apply to school age kids. You know, so the data suggests that those who have a civics education background tend to be more collaborative. You know, as Louise suggested, they tend to be smarter consumers of information. They can make distinctions. They probably have better critical thinking skills. They assumably would have better, you know, or, or um, more tolerance for different ideas. So how do you see that showing up within all states' workforce? That's a great question. And um, I think you hit the nail on the head on a number of those items, but at the core of it really um, is problem solving. I mean, that's, that's really what, uh, you know, a, a democracy is designed to do, like at, you know, at its base. Um, 
create people who understand how to solve problems with people um, who have a range of, let's say, like misalignment with their with their views. Um, they can be very small differences. They can be very large gaps. But the idea is everyone sits at the table and we and we figure it out collectively, which is really what we do in a business setting every day. Mm. Um, you know, speaking more broadly to um, how that impacts communities, I you know I, I I jotted down something Kristen said that really jumped out at me, and that was just you know um, what happens when people do have civic education and when they don't. Um, and there are three things that are very important to all state that, um, you know, there were some pretty notable differences. Uh, one was voting. So the example we just gave, I think, you know, that's, uh, that, that's proof in the pudding. Um, second is volunteerism. Um, we are a culture of volunteerism. Um, and I think, you know, civics plays right into why you would do that because there's more of a direct community connection. Um, and then the third thing is uh, advocating on issues. So, um, you know, one of the things that I, I think a, you know, a civics course does for you is provides you an opportunity um, to really learn about the nuts and bolts to make an educated decision. So if you think about it, um, something like Yelp allows consumers to go out and, you know, through sort of like crowdsourcing, make educated decisions about what they buy and where they shop. Um, when we send an advocacy email out, we, we don't try to talk at people. What we're really trying to do is like, here's some food for thought. Think about, think about this. Um, and we want to have a dialogue with you before you make any sort of decision about, well, yes, I will advocate uh, for Allstate because this issue is important to the company. We understand that there, it's more than that. It's a, it's a personal decision. And the more education you have, the more, uh, you know, the more agency and investment you have in making that decision. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Louise or Kristen, do you want to comment on that? You know, particularly thinking about how this sense of agency that a employee derives from understanding, you know, how politics works, how government functions, is there some benefit that in the business community derives where the economy derives from a more educated workforce? Well, I, I'm just going to say what, one uh, issue. We also work with Travelers Insurance, and they have a very similar program in, uh, that encourages uh, their employees to uh, participate in local government and um, become members of their community. I think it's really important for business that, that um, members, employees be close uh, to the community and to their sentiments. But more than that, so they're at the broadest level, uh, business in America functions when it has a reliable, predictable system uh, that can uh, solve problems and be predictable. The rule of law, for example, is one of the things that we cover in civic education. So um, there are sets of knowledge, like just basic knowledge about how our system works. That's really important. And there's the predictability that comes from having our population uh, understand, believe, trust in those institutions to be responsive. And that gives business leader the confidence that they can invest and know what the outcomes will be and what the rules of the road are. And that, that's a process that starts with, with their employees, but goes out to their families, to their customers, and so on and so forth, so that we can all have the system that we can, that is stable and allows economic prosperity. Right. Yeah. And I'll just quickly comment on that. Sorry, Kristen, that, you know, work we did, the BFA did last year um, on the Electoral Count Reform Act is really a perfect example of what Louise was just referring to. You know, part of the problem of uh, after the 2020 election was you know, both a willful ignorance of the law, but also maybe a misunderstanding of how of, um, how the electoral college system works and how um, states um, uh, introduce their slate of electors. And the work that many businesses supported us in doing um, about reforming the rules of the game uh, resulted in passage of, of an update of a law that was written in 1887. 
And it's, you know, for those of you who took uh, high school civics years ago, or maybe a poli-sci class sometime, a long time ago, you probably would have learned about the Electoral uh, Count Reform Act. Um, and it's really, a, you know, a, an essential functioning for political stability. So it's a good example of, again, why businesses have this vested interest in civics education. Kristen, you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I just want to underline what Chris was saying about the skill development, you know, critical thinking, working in teams, problem solving, all of those things are features, not bugs of what you get from a robust, meaningful civic education experience. We used to call those soft skills, mm. right? And now I think we in really clear and painful, sometimes painful ways, have recognized and learned that those are actually the hard skills. They're the things that are so much harder, especially in a workplace setting, to instill in folks if they haven't been brought up with them as the values and dispositions of how you engage with people. And I think we, you know, there's a lot that we can talk about and have talked about, about the kind of environmental and cultural conditions that civic education can help generate that is important to economic stability, which is valuable to workplaces. But also I think it can change internal workplace dynamics. Workplaces are often a microcosm of communities. There are the differences in opinion, in values, in experiences, in demographics, like those all exist in workplaces as much as they do in communities, as much as they do in society. And so while, while I think so far we have talked a bit more about the societal benefits, which are super important, I think we also should make sure that we're cognizant of the inter-workplace dynamics benefits that having um, a workplace that has had a civic education experience can help instill. The last thing I'll say here is as workplaces and technology and society are rapidly evolving, I think we'd be well served to think about the value of human work, as Jamie Marisotis from the Lumina Foundation calls it. There's lots that's being automated. There's lots that, you know, technology can do in terms of efficiency and innovation. There are some things that only humans can do. And if we're not focused on nurturing those things, and in my opinion, those things are things that you get from civic education for all of the reasons that we've talked about, then we're not nurturing the human work in the way that we are nurturing the, um, the technology and automation work. And I think that is a recipe for failure if we're not careful. Yeah. And just to tease that out a little further, what Kristen said, I think you know, it's important to acknowledge that all states doing both civic engagement. So, you know, they're involved in the communities. Chris noted their support of the Illinois um, requirement that all high school students have a course. Um, and then they're also doing civic in education work. So there's both an internal component to what all state and other companies are beginning to do because they've been asked by their employees to help them figure out how to participate in the election, for instance. And then the next step is to have those companies support initiatives on the ground in different communities working with state legislators. So again, I just wanted to remind those of you on the call that you know, Business for America is focused in partnership with iCivics in advocating for the adoption or expansion of legislation that would promote civics education. And that's what we're doing again in states like Indiana, Pennsylvania, um, and Ohio, um, among others. Um, Louise, let me let me go back to you for a moment. And you know, there's been a lot of controversy and I think some myths and disinformation about how curriculum actually gets developed and what gets taught. And we're seeing that now, you know, in a number of states, including Florida. So could you just remind us how uh, educational curriculum is established? It's not the U.S. Department of Education that does that. It's at the state and local level. So could you just remind us of how that actually works? Sure. 
So state establish uh, standards for each discipline, including um, mostly this would be uh, part of the social studies. Um, and those social study standards are revised on a, a regular basis, but usually eight to 10 years. Um, and uh, those standards then get adopted and uh, as part of a quasi political process for, by each state. Um, and then the districts, local districts are uh, either follow uh, those standards or develop their own based on that. And then instructional materials are aligned to those. So um, it's a very federalist system. In fact, it's more than federal. It's not even at the state level, oftentimes at the district level. So that's one. I do want to point out that there was a major effort uh, funded by both the Trump and Biden administration uh, to build a set of guidelines, not curriculum, not standards, no mandates, but guidelines from uh, 300 experts uh, in the country, funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Department of Education, to lay out a way for our country to go together. And that way is by asking questions, right? So uh, it is the fact that we have a plural yet shared story in our country, and we have to hold both of those ideas at the same time. So this group, uh, Educating for American Democracy, which ICIVICS is part along with uh, ASU, Harvard, Tufts, and many 300 experts uh, it built uh, a, uh, a, a full look at how you would teach history and civics in a way that's inclusive um, and balanced um, so as to reflect that plural yet shared story. Um, and, and that is by ensuring that we, we ask the right questions, we put that in the hands of students, and we find the answers together but community by right. community. So I would just urge people to take a look at educatingforamericandemocracy.org. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Chris, um, quick question for you, a few more details on how Allstate organizes its program. You know, is there a specific team um, that uh, provides training to your associates across the country, for instance? Um, what kinds of resources, budget? Um, is provided and you know and do you work with other companies to help them get something like what you described off the ground sure richard so um some of this is woven uh throughout our partnerships uh, with the allstate foundation um, and our inclusive diversity and equity group um and you know the um the opportunities are um you know they extend just beyond civic education um, really, um, you know, there are explorations of just youth empowerment in general. There are explorations of uh, social emo emotional learning. Um, so, you know, depending on where we're active in a given in a given community, um, it can be holistic or it can be more centered on uh, you know uh, certain educational aspects that we're looking to that we're looking to amplify um, because they're underserved in a given in a given population. Um, you know, but speaking more broadly to our, um, our government and industry relations group, which is where uh, you know, my team sits. Um, these, uh, you know, these education opportunities, these engagement opportunities are 24 seven, 365 uh, via the intranet, but also on a monthly basis with our uh, advocacy communications, which uh, you know, span a, a range of topics from you know, inviting people to participate um, in a lot of our like in-person or virtual programming to um, just letting them know what's what's going on, um, and how they can and how they can be active when the opportunity arises. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have time probably just for one more question. And Kristen and everyone's welcome to comment on this. But Kristen, let me ask you how the the survey you have been conducting and this data is it been changing? Is there some trend? that you can point to that suggests that civics education has become more of a priority um, and what might be the cause of that? Is that due to people's frustration with the political system or concern over polarization? Any sort of historic insight you have to offer here? 
Yeah, unfortunately, we do not have longitudinal data from our survey. This was the first time we've asked it. And to the best of my knowledge, the other polls that I showed were asked for the first time last mm -hmm. year as well. So I don't know that we have a trend line on support for civic education. I will say the signal data that I showed, they did ask a question to the effect of, do you believe that civic education is more important now than before? And I believe specifically um, people said it's over 70%. I don't remember the exact number off my head, but it's over 70% said, yes, it is more important now than it was even five years ago. And so I think we are seeing an uptick in that. I think, I think it could be attributable to a number of things, but I think what it really is at its core is a realization that how we've under invested in civic education. For a long time, and I'm sure Louise and Chris have had this experience too, for a long time when I would go out and talk to people about things like this, they'd be like, oh, that's sweet. You're cute. That's nice. Like Because they thought that what civic education was, was, do you know, it, it was the purpose of civic education was to not be embarrassed and jaywalking, right? <laughs> when you didn't know the answer to the basic questions on jaywalking, like that was what people seemed to think was why civic education mattered. And now, regardless of where you spit up, sit on the spectrum, regardless of how you're doing in life, I think people are saying a lot of things are not working for me, for people mm -hmm. around me, for our society as a whole. And there's a different level of realization about what happens when we underinvest in civic education. Um, what happens politically, what happens societally, how we treat each other. Like there are significant ramifications for this. And regardless of why you think things aren't going well. I think there is a broad recognition that they're not and that civic education can be a way to break some of those or at least interrupt some of those otherwise cyclical and systemic problems. Great, thank you. Yeah. yeah. And, well, and, and if I may you. very quickly, I know we're at time, but uh, you know, the Edelman Trust Barometer and other um, you know, notable resources point out that um, people now trust business more than government or a number of other institutions. So there's a, you know, a direct responsibility of business to engage on this. Right. Good. And, and with that, um, I want to thank uh, Kristen, Louise, and Chris very much, and thank all of you who attended. And uh, do remember that if this topic, uh, you know, compels you to uh, take some action, please contact uh, Business for America. You can subscribe to our newsletter. You can just also reach out to me at richard at bfa.us. You know, we do plan again to be working in multiple states across the country and also be pushing for reintroduction of this, a version of the Civic Secures Democracy Act. And, you know, as Kristen just pointed out, it's really a national priority that we increase the investment in civic education in order to have a healthier democracy. Thank you again, Kristen, Louise, and Chris, really appreciate your time today. Thanks, everyone.